A, guru, a very good welcome once again to our online class on the digestive system. I hope you're well. Today we are going to look at uh, development and congenital malformations of the holo-GIT. Just to help you capture where we are in terms of our lecture series on the anatomy of the digestive system, we are now in this part four. We've already looked at uh, the first three in green. Now, when I was preparing for this part four, I realized that it's going to be really long. So I chose to divide it into two, the first section and the second section, but still focusing on development and congenital anomalies of the holo GIT. Then the fifth part will be the one focusing on hepatobiliary system. So this fourth part, development of the holo GIT, I've chosen to divide it into two. The first part is what you're going to handle in this particular lecture. And this first part therefore will be brief and to the point, the second part will be slightly longer, but at least if we capture the concepts of the first part nicely, it will be easier to go through the second part. In this first part, I'm going to focus on the embryonic origins of the digestive system. I'm also going to focus on the formation parts and derivatives of the primordial gut. Then in the second section, in another class, we will then look at the specific organs which constitute the holo GIT and how they develop. But just to help you orient, uh, if you got forgotten, remember we divide the components of the digestive system into two. We have the holo GIT and the extrinsic organs. Holo GIT is the part that is followed by food. Now, this part that is followed by food basically contain a lot of tissue elements within its wall. In addition to those tissue elements in the wall, remember that uh, the holo GIT, its wall contain intrinsic glands. Those glands can either be within the mucosa or in the submucosa. But intrinsic glands are part of the holo GIT. And so when we are describing development of the holo GIT, we also talk about development of those glands. However, the extrinsic organs of glands are not part of this. These are the glands which empty into the holo GIT and they include salivary glands, pancreas, liver, and biliary system. Those ones we not look at in this particular lecture, but look at them in another lecture. Remember the components of the alimentary canal from the oral cavity, food goes to the pharynx, then esophagus, stomach, small intestine and large intestine. So in this particular lecture today, we'll focus on the basic component, basic uh, concepts that we need to capture regarding development of the gut. Then in the second part, that's when you're going to look at the development and malformations of this specific organs from oral cavity all the way to the large intestines. In terms of structure organization of the JT wall, again, remember that uh, the JT wall has four histological layers. Innermost layer called the mucosa that consists of lining epithelium, lamina propria, and muscularis mucosa. Importantly, the mucosal layer may contain mucosal glands. The submucosal layer is made up of dense irregular connective tissue with or without some submucosal glands. The regions with submucosal glands are esophagus and the duodenum. Importantly, the submucosal gland, sub, the submucosa also contain submucosal nerve plexus, which are part of the enteric nervous system. The muscular layer of the JT is predominantly of smooth muscle. Inner circular layer and outer longitudinal layer 
albeit a few variations that you might be aware of by now. Then we have the adventitia, which is a connective tissue. We call it serosa if it contain visceral peritoneum lining. it. So those are the histological layers of the JT wall. That is important again to remember, even as we go through this particular class. This captures for you the four layers, but also captures for you the presence of the enteric nervous system, which is found within the submucosa, controlling secretions, and uh, within the muscular layer, what we call my enteric nerve plexus, which control contractions. Having said so, we can now focus on our learning outcome for this particular class. So this is what you're going to learn. We are going to review the process of embryonic folding and state the effect of embryonic folding on the yolk sac. That is very vital for us to understand development of the JT. We are then going to state the embryonic origins of the different tissues and organs of the digestive system. We are just going to state where these ones come from. There's something called the primordial gut. We're also going to look at the specific parts of the primordial gut and the derivatives of each part of the primordial gut. And lastly, we look at the vascular territories of the digestive system from an embryological point of view. We already know them from gross. We we'll now understand them from embryological point of view. So this today's class is very straightforward, very brief, but very vital for us to be able to understand the next one, which will be focusing on specific organs. Let's begin with the first agenda there to review the process of embryonic folding and state the effects of this on the yolk sac. The image to your left shows you embryonic folding in the transverse plane. And there'll be another video to your right here which will be showing you embryonic folding in the sagittal plane. Let me start by playing the video on the left, which captures for us embryonic folding in the transverse plane. Basically, if that's the amniotic sac, this is the yolk sac, this is the embryo, the trilaminal embryo. We see, first of all, before the folding begins that the ectoderm falls, so that new relation is taking place. But we also see that the mesoderm splits into three parts, paraxial, intermediate, and lateral plate. Now that is new relation completed. Remember when new relation is complete, we also have neural crest. But now see that folding in the transverse plane, making the embryo now become cylindrical from being flat is now cylindrical. But importantly, we also see that some part of the yolk sac is now here inside the baby. This is the baby. And some part of the yolk sac is outside. We also see the formation of the peritoneal cavity there. Maybe I play that again so that you capture that very well. So you can see that again. So focus on the yolk sac primarily right now. As the embryo falls in the transverse axis, it's about to start. It's now happening. As the embryo falls, see what happened to the yolk sac, becoming smaller and smaller. But importantly, some part of the yolk sac is being incorporated into the embryo. And some part of the yolk sac remain outside. Now we can see the folding in the sagittal plane. So we are focusing on the video to your right. Amniotic sac, yolk sac. Lantois is there. That's a connecting stalk. This is the future brain, that's the future heart. See what's going to happen as the embryo falls in the sagittal axis. And uh, we can focus on the overall shape of the baby as well as the what's happened to the yolk sac. So the overall shape is 
calving, but importantly, look at what's happened to the yolk sac. The dorsal part of the yolk sac is being incorporated into the baby. And uh, this ventral part of the yolk sac is becoming smaller and smaller, but we see a connection between the two. So it ends there. This one here is a part of the yolk sac that has been incorporated. So we can say the following, that the embryo falls in two planes, the longitudinal axis and the transverse axis. The longitudinal axis is also called the cranocaudal or the sagittal folding. The transverse axis is also called the lateral folding. As the embryo falls in those two axes, some things happen to the yolk sac. Well, we are aware of many changes that occur as a result of embryonic folding. But let's narrow down to the changes that involve the yolk sac. As the embryo falls, we've noted that the ventral aspect of the yolk sac shrinks, becomes smaller. Initially, there's a connection between the part of the yolk sac that has been incorporated and the part that's remaining outside, we call that the vitelline duct. So initially, that channel is called the vitelline duct. The dorsal part of the yolk sac, as the embryo falls, become incorporated into the embryo as a longitudinal incorporation, extending from the cranial end to the caudal end of the embryo. That incorporated part of the yolk sac become the primordial gut, which is the primary alimentary canal. We can call the primitive gut tube. So that is very important. And that's why we had to talk about the folding of the embryo. Now that primordial gut can be described to have three basic parts, the foregut, the midgut, and the hindgut. Let's see that in this image once again. So if this is the yolk sac, as the embryo falls, the ventral part becomes smaller, but there's a connection, which are called the vitelline duct. How about the dorsal part? The dorsal part becomes incorporated into the embryo. And that dorsal part is the one we are calling the primordial gut or the primitive alimentary canal. Extending from the cranial end this side, to the caudal end that side, we have three segments of the primordial gut. The foregut, this one, midgut, and hindgut. Let's look at the tissues that form the wall of the primordial gut. Again, let me take you back to the second week of embryonic development, where we have the epiblast and the hypoblast. During the second week of development, we know that uh, there are some two cavities that form. Amniotic cavity form from the migrating cells of the epiblast, we call those cells amnioblast cells. And so this becomes the amniotic cavity, which contain amniotic fluid. In this other end, the cells of the hypoblast are the ones which migrate away from it. And the migrating cells of the hypoblast are the ones that constitute the yolk sac. So that yolk sac is formed by the cells of the hypoblast at this particular point. Remember the functions of the yolk sac. There are many providing nutrition for the baby. It's also a site of hemopoiesis, formation of blood. We also know that the cells of the yolk sac, some cells of the yolk sac contribute to giving rise to the primordial germ cells. So it gives rise to primordial germ cells. Now, in the second week, the cells of the yolk sac are basically hypoblast. But what happens when we go to the third week? When you go to the third week, the process of gastrulation takes place. And so we have a layer called endoderm. That endoderm layer is the one that extends to line the yolk sac in the third week going forwards. And so later on, we can say, therefore, that the yolk sac is lined by endoderm. Now, not hypoblast cells, but endodermal cells. That is important to capture. 
So in this image that is capturing for us the transverse folding, this is the yolk sac and the yellow are the endodermal cells that line the yolk sac. We can follow that through all the way to here. Now let's see what happened to the mesoderm. The mesoderm usually splits into three paraxial mesoderm, intermediate mesoderm, and lateral plate mesoderm. The lateral plate mesoderm splits into two, the parietal layer, which is also called the somatic layer of the lateral plate mesoderm, and the visceral layer, which is also called the splanchnic layer of the lateral plate mesoderm. Now follow that to the fourth image, and we note that the splanchnic mesoderm is very intimate with the endoderm. This part of the endoderm, this part of the yolk sac is the one that is going to be incorporated to form the alimentary canal or the primitive alimentary canal. And so we can see that endoderm is just next to it. And extend to that, we have this planktic mesoderm. And so this is what we are seeing after full folding that the the primitive gut tube is that one, which is this or that one. So look at the tissues that form the wall of the primitive gut tube. There are two tissue layers that form the wall of the primitive gut tube. We have endoderm internally, and we have splanchnic mesoderm externally. Take that home, that there are two tissue layers that form the wall of the gut tube of the primitive gut tube, endoderm inside and splanctic mesoderm externally. Good, so we've addressed the first agenda, which is the process of embryonic folding and its effects on the yolk sac. Having said that uh, the proximal, the, the dorsal part of the yolk sac is incorporated from the tube, and we mentioned the tissue layers that form the wall of the tube. We can now talk about the tissues that, the germ layers that give rise to the various tissues of the digestive system. We can talk about the origins. The endoderm that we've seen inside contributes to the formation of the alimentary canal or formation of the digestive system. You may ask yourself how. So if this was a mesoderm in the third week, going to the fourth week, sorry, endoderm in the third week, that one, going to the fourth week, that one. After complete folding, that's the endoderm inside. It is the innermost layer of the gut tube. This endoderm layer, therefore, gives rise to the epithelial lining of the hologit. So think about the epithelium, that stratified squamous non chrysinous epithelium of the esophagus, or the glandular epithelium of the stomach, that simple column epithelium of the intestine, it comes from endoderm layer. Apart from the epithelial lining, endoderm also gives rise to the parenchyma of the glands of the digestive system. These glands can either be intrinsic, which means that they are found within the wall of the GIT, either as uh, mucosal glands or submucosal glands. But this also includes the extensive glands of the digestive system. And at this point, we have in mind the parenchyma of the pancreas, the parenchyma of the liver, and that of the biliary system. Those tissues that arise from those, the, the tissues that form those glands come from endoderm layer. So those organs form as diverticulum from the endoderm. How about the splanchnic mesoderm? Splanchnic mesoderm is another structure or embryonic layer that give rise to the digestive system. Because we've mentioned that the splanchnic mesoderm is just external to the endoderm. This splanchnic mesoderm forms the wall of the gut tube and it gives rise to 
the connective tissue elements of the gut tube. So think about the histology once again. There's a tissue layer that is beneath the epithelial lining we call the lamina propria. It's a connective tissue layer. So it will come from splatic mesoderm. The submucosa itself contain the connective tissue element as well. So that one also come from splatic mesoderm. The adventitia of the gut wall, it's a thin connective tissue layer. It also comes from splatic mesoderm. Apart from connective tissue elements, the smooth musculature of the gut wall also come from splatic mesoderm. Remember, there could be muscularis mucosae, or they could be the muscularis propria. And muscularis propria consists of the inner circular and outer longitudinal largely. They come from splanctic mesoderm. Lastly, the splanctic mesoderm also gives rise to the visceral peritoneum, that membrane that lines the intestines and uh, some organs of the digestive system, as well as the mesentery. The mesentery refers to this thing here that suspend the intestines, for example, or the gut. And so therefore making the gut mobile, we've seen the mesentery from gross anatomy. The third tissue layer that, the third tissue, embryonic tissue that give rise to the organs and tissues of the digestive system is the neurocrest. Now remember neurocrest, comes as a result of neurulation, primary neurulation to be specific, where the ectoderm undergoes differentiation to form the neuroectoderm and surface ectoderm. The neuroectoderm then undergoes folding. And after it has undergone folding, the folds fuse to form the primary neurotube. So this is the primary neurotube. However, not all the cells of the neuroplates become incorporated into the neurotube. There are some cells of the neuroplate or neuroepithelium that bud off from the neurotube and they become free. We call them the neural crest cells. Neural crest cells have multiple characteristics. They are multipotent, which means that they give rise to multiple tissue lines. They're also migratory which means that they can move from one place to another. And we can write on those concepts to tell us, therefore, what neurocrest gives us in the digestive system. Usually, the neurocrest cells migrate into the developing GIT and invade it. And as the neurocrest cells migrate, they migrate from fairly from a cranial towards a caudal pass region which means that the parts of the whole that receive the neurocrest cells last are perhaps the rectum there, the lowermost parts. And the parts that receive it first could be the proximal segments generally. After the cells of the neurocrest have invaded the developing gut, like we can see in this particular image, these neurocrest cells differentiate and give rise to the neuronal elements that are within the wall of the JT. So remember the neuronal elements which are in the wall of the JT constitute what we call the enteric nervous system. There are two components of the enteric nervous system. The submucosal plexus, which is also called the Meissner's plexus, and the myenteric plexus, which is also called the Albach plexus. Those two plexus of nerves are derived from neurocrest cells. We can see them here. The myenteric plexus are located within the muscular layer. They control peristalsis. And submucosal plexus are located within the submucosa. They control JT secretions. Now, that's not enough. The image you're seeing here is an image of the developing JT after the primitive gut tube has been incorporated. And uh, we can see that some organs now even start to form. So this is the region we're calling the foregut. This is the region we're calling the midgut. 
And that's the region we are calling the hind gut. Importantly, we see that uh, the primitive alimentary canal is closed on both ends, that side and that side, they're both closed. The regions of the HoloJT, the primitive alimentary canal that are closed, are lined by surface ectoderm externally. Now you need to understand that one, that uh, from outside we generally have ectoderm and from inside we have endoderm. So from outside here, we have surface ectoderm lining this region up to there. And even here up to there, surface ectoderm. So surface ectoderm usually line the external parts, external ends of the primordial gut tube. These external ends of the primordial gut tube have names. This one is called the bucopharyngeal membrane. The bucopharyngeal membrane is the cranial end of the primordial gut tube. And this bucopharyngeal membrane separates the primitive gut tube from what we call the stomodium. The stomodium is the invagination that is going to give rise to the mouth. So the future oral cavity is there. Remember, lined by ectoderm, not endoderm, but ectoderm. Similarly, on the lower end, we have what we call the cloacal membrane. The cloacal membrane, this one, separate what we call the cloaca from the proctodium. Now, let me define a few things. If this is the hind gut, sorry, this is the mid gut, and this is the hind gut. The hind gut is connected to the allantois. The connection between the two is called the cloaca. This cloaca represents common communication between the primitive digestive system and the primitive urogenital tract. So at this point, you have a common structure called the cloaca. Some things happen to the cloaca so that in humans, stool and urine go separate ways as we know it. But embryologically, at some point, they're actually together. So the membrane of the cloaca is there, the lower end of the primordial gut. And then beyond that, we have what we call the proctodium. Again, it's an invagination at the future site of the anal opening. Therefore, again, the proctodium is lined by surface ectoderm. So what are we saying here? Even though we say that most of the parts of the JT will be lined by endoderm, the two extreme ends of the alimentary canal are not lined by endoderm, but they're lined by surface ectoderm. And so this surface ectoderm is also going to contribute to the development cranially of the oral cavity and caudally of the anal tube. So those are the tissue layers that give rise to the various components of the hollow JT. Now we can focus on the third agenda, the parts and derivatives of each part of the alimentary canal or the primordial gut tube. First, let's revisit the fact that we have different parts of the primordial gut tube. The primordial gut tube has three segments. We have the foregut, which extends from the bucopharyngeal membrane so from cranial end. We have the mid gut, this part, which is attached to the vitelline duct or attached to the degenerating yolk sac through the vitelline duct. And we have the hind gut. The hind gut is the one that is caudal and is the one that is connected to the lantois through the cloaca. So the three segments of the primordial gut. Let's look at the derivatives of each segment. We start with the derivatives of the four guts, this region from there to there. What does it give rise to? 
the segment you are calling Fogat extends from the pharynx all the way to the duodenum. So if you want to think about the derivatives of the Fogat, then think about that segment from the pharynx all the way in that region to the duodenum there. Having said so, we can say that the foregut gives rise to the following. There are some gut segments which come from the foregut. And if you are to go in order, so you can mention the pharynx. After pharynx, the esophagus. After esophagus, the, the stomach there. After stomach, the duodenum. We don't take the whole duodenum, we only take the proximal duodenum. Remember duodenum has four parts, D1, D2, D3, and D4. The foregut gives rise to D1 and the proximal part of the D2. So we end it somewhere there. That's the junction of the foregut and the midgut. Apart from the gut segments, foregut also gives you the ex extensic organs. In this case, we can see the liver there. We can also notice the biliary tree and we can notice the pancreas as well. So those ones are also foregut derivatives. The parenchyma of those organs come from the endoderm of the foregut. The lower respiratory tract is not left behind the lower respiratory tract also arise from the foregut, and in particular, the anterior aspect of the primitive foregut, so that the lower respiratory tract will have to separate from the digestive system through what we call foregut septation, so that the anterior part become the lower respiratory tree or tract. We have in mind the larynx trachea, the bronchi, the bronchioles, and indeed the whole lung come from the foregut. So those are the foregut derivatives. Now let's talk about the midgut derivatives. The segment you are calling midgut extends from the duodenum where the first one, where the foregut left it. So that was D2. All the way to the junction between the middle right and left or the right two thirds and the left one third of the transverse colon. So extending from the middle to the right two thirds of the transverse colon, that the junction between the midgut and the hindgut. Having said so, we can look at that here. So if the D2 was somewhere there, midgut begins from there. So part of D2, the distal part of D2, all the way to somewhere there, which will correspond the junction somewhere within the transverse column, basically. We can therefore say that the midgut gives rise to the following. Midgut gives rise to the small intestine. So maybe from there, the distal part of D2, then even D3 and D4 up to somewhere there. Then the whole of the jejunum, perhaps the whole of that up to somewhere there. Then the whole of the ilium, now the ilium will go up to even beyond the apex of the midgut there, up to somewhere there, that would be midgut or rather that would be ilium. So the whole of that small intestine ends somewhere there. Point is it's not ending at that junction, but slightly passes it a bit. So small intestines come from the midgut, but we also have the proximal parts of the large gut. The proximal parts of the large gut are the parts of the large gut which are on the right side. So we can say the right large gut. The right large gut come from the mid gut. So in this case, perhaps from there, that is where we have the cecum together with the appendix. 
And then we have perhaps the ascending column. And then the right part of the transverse column. We can go to the middle, which means the first half, or we can go up to the two thirds of the transverse column. The whole of that is mid gut. And so those are the derivatives of the mid gut. Then we have the hind gut derivatives. Hind gut derivatives are now the rest. Now remember, hind gut extends all the way from where the mid gut has left it to what we call the cloaca, as I've already mentioned to you. The union of the hind gut and the lanto is called the cloaca. The hind gut, therefore, contributes to the formation of the left large bowel. We are then talking about the distal part of the transverse colon. We are also talking about the descending colon, and we're talking about the sigmoid colon. Those ones come from the free part of the hind gut. Then there's this part of the hind gut that is communicating with the lantois, which we call the cloaca. That part must undergo partitioning as being shown in this particular image. If this is the cloaca, this is the hind gut, this is the lantois. There's a septum that forms in the coronal plane of the cloaca that split the cloaca into two so that you have an anterior part called the urogenital sinus and the posterior part called the anorectal canal. Once the cloaca has undergone partitioning, we can see that the hind gut continues with the posterior partition of the cloaca. The region of the hind gut that came from the cloaca, what you're calling an erectal canal, will therefore give rise to the rectum and the anus. But as I've mentioned to you, the anus also come from the proctodium. So generally, the upper part of the anus is the one that comes from the an erectal canal the lower part of the anus come from the proctodium. Initially, there's a membrane, an old membrane that separates the two. That membrane must undergo canalization so that you have one long anal tube. The junction between the two could also be noted as a, a line, we call it pectinate line, that separates the proximal anal canal arising from the anorectal canal from the distal anal canal arising from the proctodium. The proctodium will be somewhere here. Okay, those are the derivatives of the hind gut. Let's now do the last part. Talk about the basis of the vascular territories of the digestive system. So, as the digestive system develops, we have some blood vessels which usually supply the yolk sac. The blood vessels which supply the yolk sac constitute, constitute what we call the vitelline vessels. So these vitelline vessels take blood to the yolk sac and away from the yolk sac. We have vitelline arteries which branch from the descending outer. And we have the vitellin veins, which take blood to the right atrium. As the yolk sac develops and involutes, the vessels which supply the yolk sac also involute. Even though they involute, three vessels remain. Those three vessels that remain are the ones which contribute to the blood supply to the digestive system, at least the abdominal digestive system, three blood vessels. So those three blood vessels are remnants of the primitive vitelline circulation to the yolk sac, which are these three blood vessels. 
the celiac trunk or artery, superior mesenteric and inferior mesenteric artery. The celiac artery, also known as the superior, the, the celiac trunk, supplies the derivatives of the foregut. Now remember, it gives you the left gastric artery to the stomach. It gives you the common hepatic artery, which goes to the liver, stomach, pancreas, and duodenum. But it also gives you what you call the splenic artery, which goes to the spleen. And that tells you something. The spleen development is also closely related to the development of the foregut. However, the spleen does not come from the foregut. It only comes from the mesentery of the stomach. The mesentery of the stomach is called the mesogastrium. It arises from the mesenchymal cells within the mesogastrium. And it's because of that that it will share blood supply with the stomach, basically. So celiac trunk gives you three arteries, left gastric, common hepatic, and splenic artery. The superior mesenteric artery supplied the derivatives of the midgut, which you define very well. So it will give you branches which go to the duodenum, to the jejunum, to the ileum, appendix, cecum, ascending colon, and uh, transverse colon. That is superior mesenteric artery. And lastly, we have the inferior mesenteric artery, which supplies the derivatives of the hindgut. So this one give you branches which go to the left colon. We call that left colic artery. It also gives you branch which go to the sigmoid. We call those one sigmoid branches. And importantly, it gives you branches which go to the upper part of the rectum. That is called the superior rectal artery. So these three are the remnants of the primitive vital circulation. And they're the ones which supply the derivatives of the digestive system, basically. The images we are seeing here are images of arteriogram of the three arteries. The first one shows you the celiac artery axis, second one for superior mesenteric axis, and the third one for the inferior mesenteric axis. In this first one, you can appreciate the left, sorry, this one here is the splenic artery, and that one there is the common hepatic artery we can see the left gastric there. So that is celiac trunk. In the second one, the superior mesenteric axis, we can see the branches that uh, superior mesenteric axis supplies. These ones, the jejunal and the ileal branches, basically. And then the third one, the catheter is on inferior mesenteric here giving us the left colic artery, and those ones which go to the sigmoid as well as the upper part of the rectum. So it is important then to understand why some organs are supplied by both, by two arterial systems. For example, duodenum receives blood supply from both celiac trunk and superior mesenteric artery because the junction between the foregut and the midgut. Transverse colon is also supplied by both superior as well as inferior mesenteric arteries. The reason is because it is a derivative of both the midgut and the hindgut. Great, so that is it basically for what that part, first part that I wanted to talk about, highlighting the basic concepts of development of the digestive system. As I told you earlier, I chose to divide that lecture into two so that uh, we don't have a lot of long screen time. So the second part will now be focusing on development and congenital malformations of specific parts of the whole of JT. In particular, we'll talk about this esophagus, the stomach, and the intestines in general. For now, we will stop there. <laughs>